And then again, taking them into hands-on sawbones types of workshops. And some young uh, women have never necessarily handled a, a power tool. And so we do that in orthopedics. And so we get their hands on it and let them try it in a safe environment. And many of them, that may have been the thing that was intimidating to them about it. Maybe they had never seen women. And so we put in front of them women, you know, residents, fellows, uh, tendings, um, who are orthopedic surgeons who look and and uh, are very similar to them and, and have lives, you know, and we show them that it's possible. Hi, everyone. Welcome to episode three of The Breakdown with Rothman Orthopedics. I'm your host, Alex Hammond, and in honor of March being Women's History Month and International Women's Day being on March 8th, we're going to speak with four of Rothman's own female physicians about their personal and professional experiences about being women in orthopedics. So we'll have two separate conversations, first with Dr. Megan Bishop, she's a sports medicine surgeon, and Dr. Melody Rubis, she's a non-operative sports medicine physician. And then our second conversation will be with Dr. Summer Hamoud, she's also a sports medicine surgeon, and then Dr. Rachel Shaked, she is one of our foot and ankle surgeons here. And then lastly, we'll kind of tie it all up with President of Rothman Orthopedics, Dr. Alex Vaccaro, just coming back on to get his insight on the topic of diversifying orthopedics. He's not only a leader of this organization, but he's a leader in the field of orthopedics, so I thought it was important that we gain his insight on the topic. So first up, I'd like to welcome Dr. Megan Bishop and Dr. Melody Rubish, sports medicine surgeon and sports medicine physician, non-operative, respectively. Looking forward to this conversation, so I just want to jump right in. And I think it's important that we both kind of like set the scene of your individual background. So um, appropriately, just want to start, you know, whoever wants to go first about your education and background. So who wants to lead it off? I can lead it off. Uh, this is uh, Megan Bishop. Alex, thanks for having us. So I am originally from outside of Philadelphia. So I was from a local high school, Gwynn Mercy Academy in the suburbs of Philadelphia. I was a pretty competitive track athlete uh, then. And I went on to run um, Division One track and field and cross country at the College of William and Mary. Kind of throughout that process, I became interested in kind of sports medicine and injuries, having injuries myself and seeing a lot of my teammates that had injuries and it kind of got me involved into working in our training room in college so you know that's kind of how I initially started to get interested in sports medicine then I did my um, medical school at GW in DC uh, and then went on to do my residency at uh, Jefferson so and now I'm up in Rothman in New York so that's kind of where it's carried me and also had done my fellowship in sports medicine at HSS so sorry I forgot to mention that. Awesome. And Dr. Rubish, what about you? Well, uh, I grew up in Colorado, actually. I did high school and undergrad there. And then I did my training in Chicago. So medical school residency fellowship was all in Chicago and I actually practiced there for a while. And when I was in Chicago, I really got into working out and running and I ran a few marathons, but never as fast as Dr. Bishop does. <laughs> but I really <laughs> liked it. And I found even though medical school was super busy, I was reading a lot about how to do things better, how to prevent injury. And it was kind of the stuff that I was just interested in. So that's how I sort of got into sports medicine. I got to do a really cool sports medicine rotation with a surgeon and a physical medicine rehabilitation doctor. They were a great team. They worked well together and they were team docs for a college for University of Illinois at Chicago. I just liked their practice and I thought that'd be fun, a fun way to work. So I ended up doing a fellowship with them and staying on for a while. But I moved to New York about two years ago when I joined Rothman. And so I lost my college team, but I picked up the Rockettes, who is my new sports team. And I also get to still work with U.S. soccer. So that's kind of the sports medicine stuff for me. Awesome. You know, just hearing your background have some outstanding credentials and just saying this before we even kind of go in that we're very lucky to have you both, which is why I figured it would be great to have these conversations with you two. So Hearing both of you how, you know, you got into the field of sports medicine, obviously, you know, and with orthopedics. And, you know, I mentioned to you kind of when we were talking offline, you know, it says that there are more women in medical school. But as far as women in orthopedics, they actually only represent about 14 percent of orthopedic trainees. So how does one get into as a female who, who inspired you to get into this field? That's a great question, Alex. I mean, 
I think one of the really important things for me was having a very good mentor. In between my first and second year of medical school, I ended up working with Dr. Robin West, who is now at Inova Healthcare down in DC and is actually the team doctor of the Washington football team, as well as the Washington Nationals. When she was back in Pittsburgh, I ended up doing a summer of just kind of working with her. And she really kind of showed me what you can do as a, as a female sports medicine physician. And, you know, I've always would love to emulate her career. She's really done amazing things. So she was definitely very important in my decision to go into orthopedics and kind of, you know, made me realize that having a very good mentor is definitely important. And I think for our future female physicians that are coming through, like I would encourage them to try to, you know, take that chance and seek out to be able to have those opportunities to work with some of the uh, female physicians that we have, because that's kind of the path that I took. And I think it was really helpful for me. Yeah, I was actually just going to touch on that because you hit home when you said, you know, having it's important to have a mentor. So Dr. Rubish, maybe you can speak a little bit about that. Like how important is it? And does it really matter? Like when you look for a mentor in this field, does it have to be a female or does it have to be a male? Or is it just someone who is just willing to kind of help you along the way? Does that matter? You know, it's actually funny that you mentioned that because both of my closest mentors in training were men. The practice that I joined, actually, there were no females. There were no other females the entire time I was in that orthopedic practice. But what's interesting is the orthopedic surgeon, Dr. Mark Hutchinson, who was a big mentor for me, and he was kind of the one who said, I know you don't see this perspective, but I know where you could go, and I want to sort of help light that way and give you opportunities. His mentor was a female. So even though he was very well established in practice, his mentor was a female and he always wanted to try to make sure that there was a good diversity in training. And he always, as a team doc, he wanted to have a female physician partner with him because we had 400 division one athletes and half of those were female and they didn't have a female doc they could go to. So he was the one who really pushed to say, we need to get that as part of our team. So yeah, Mary Lloyd Ireland in Kentucky, she's a famous orthopedic surgeon. She's been around and she's really kind of lit the way for my mentor who then turned around and led it for me. So I think that's pretty cool. That it was a guy that was mentored by a female. Definitely. And just something like you touched on where you said, you know, a bunch of the athletes that you had, they were female. So just having, you know, a female, someone who who relates to them, you know, I guess kind of leads into my next question. Why is diversity important in orthopedics? And we can speak here. We can talk about women. We could talk about, you know, people of color. But why is that important? I think that you mentioned diversity, not just gender, but racial and background and age. All of that, I think, is important because not just the physicians, but the team needs to be able to see themselves. And they need to know that they're being heard. And sometimes it isn't just verbal communication. So that diversity of experience then leads to a diversity of planning. And then the patient benefits. So if we're thinking of ourselves as a medical team, of the sports team, then the more of us that come from different perspectives, the the athlete's going to benefit. Yeah, I completely agree. The different perspectives that um, come from having a diverse physician team Uh, is incredibly important just looking at our patient population as sports medicine surgeons. And really, you know, having a diverse team allows us to treat our patients better. Studies have shown that there's higher patient satisfaction as well as workplace satisfaction when you have a diverse team. So, I mean, I think that's really important. And even like looking at some things with orthopedics, like looking at continuing research and innovation, um, you know, a lot of the research that's been done in orthopedics really has been pretty only on white males uh, right. and not very diverse. So, yeah. you know, I think that is an important thing to continue to add diversity to in orthopedics as well. Uh, we actually did an interesting study that I wanted to bring up because I just thought it was interesting looking at uh, hand size and orthopedic instruments and did a survey of surgeons with males and females to see if there was any kind of difference in injury rates or reported pain based on using orthopedic instruments. We found that people with smaller hand sizes had increased pain and increased uh, injury rates. So, I mean, this just shows even in orthopedics, like using instruments isn't very diverse yet between males and females and things like that. So, you know, we, we definitely have a long way to go kind of in all spectrums from the patient care to even continuing through research and innovation. Well, and to tag on to that, Dr. Bishop, I think what's fun about kind of our relationship is that we actually come from separate backgrounds. We both did a fellowship in sports medicine, but you did your residency in orthopedics surgery, and I did mine in physical medicine and rehabilitation. So when you and I share patients, we often will say, can you look at this? Because I don't know how to 
consider if they need surgery or not? Or I would like to know if it's okay for me to keep them and keep working with rehabilitation. Or do you think that it's time to do something anatomically to fix them? So even that diversity within physicians, but then like Megan and I send people to physical therapists or we work with athletic trainers. And so we are all approaching the problem from a different angle. And so when we communicate, which is just as important, then we actually can come up with maybe a super plan, which is better than just an individual plan. So as far as, I don't want to put this on the both of you, because I don't necessarily think maybe, you know, in a few years that this is your responsibility, but we have such a low number of orthopedists that are female. So whose responsibility is it to kind of uplift the next generation, the next group? Who do we need help from? I think it's all of our responsibilities. I mean, the first step was recognizing that we have a lack of diversity in orthopedics, which I think, you know, is being more and more recognized at this point. And then we need strong advocates, you know, both males and females to be able to enact change for this. And, you know, I think this is done through having strong mentors uh, for our up and coming physicians that are interested in orthopedics. Um, We also have societies like the Ruth Jackson Orthopedic Society, which is a kind of a female led orthopedic society that promotes uh, female orthopedic surgeons. However, males are allowed to be in this society as well. In terms of racial diversity, there's the Robert J. Gladden Society as well. So, you know, working from these societies has been specifically made to create diversity. I think those are good stepping stones. I know that a couple of the major Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, as well as AOSSM for Sports Medicine, recently created diversity task forces just in this last couple of years, too. So, you know, starting from the top is is very important as well. But, you know, just on a daily basis, each surgeon, you know, trying to be able to kind of take on that role as a mentor, if it does come up, I I think that's an important thing, especially trying to mentor our younger uh, female applicants as well as racially diverse applicants. So yeah, same thing about some of the sports medicine societies like American Medical Society for Sports Medicine and the American College of Sports Medicine. They realize they have female members, but those women aren't always getting the leadership role. So it's not just having them be part of things, but how do they get to the next level? So they've created mentorships. So maybe you're in a group, you don't have somebody you can just walk up to and say, can you help me accomplish these things? They create something for people to be able to sign up so that they can have somebody guide them and say, oh, you didn't know about this opportunity or did you know you could attend this meeting? Because I think part of what's difficult when you're coming up is you don't know what you don't know. You don't know what societies are out there. You don't know what meetings are super helpful. So having somebody who can just sort of say, this is an opportunity if you're interested, then it makes it easier. You still have to do the work, but you're not trying to figure out where the work is to do. So I actually got contacted yesterday by a patient of mine from a few years ago. She's uh, She was a dancer. She's in high school now. She's the president of her high school's, um, it's her high school club, they call it the Medic Club, and it's for future doctors and healthcare workers. And she asked if I would just come speak just through webinar to the high schoolers about how I got to be a doctor and how I recommend getting there. I think those little things make a big difference, big waves later on. Yeah, I, I agree, Melody. I mean, that that's one of the things I've always tried to make sure, like personally, if anyone ever asks me to do something, I usually say yes, like in terms of mentoring. Like two summers ago, I had two uh, college students who I'd never met before that asked if they could come shadow me in the office. And they came shadow me and published two research papers out of it. So, you know, and then recently I randomly had two high school students contact me to mentor them through like a science fair project that we're going to do on female ACL injuries. So, you know, just always being available to help the younger generation and really not saying no to that. I would have appreciated that when I was applying an interest in orthopedics. So I always just try to make sure that I had the same respect for uh, our younger generation and that that could be potentially interested as well. Yeah. And actually, so our fellowship director for non-operative sports medicine, when they were doing interviews for residents to become fellows for this next year, they ask about their interests. And he did a great job of, he sent an email to me and CC'd one of the applicants who ended up not matching at Rothman, but she has a great interest in dance medicine and she didn't know where to start. And so he just sent an email just connecting us. So it just takes something that small and then we can take it from there. And it's a lot. What are you most proud of in your career? So I would say, If somebody asks me what I'm happiest about in my career and what I'm the most proud of, it's the relationships that I've formed. It's not necessarily 
what I have accomplished in terms of the teams that I've covered or the sports that I've covered or the trips that I've gone on as a sports medicine physician. It's being able to elevate the practice through working with other people. So I feel like what I'm the most proud of is every day. Like the one patient that comes in and doesn't know what's going on and I'm their fourth opinion and I can figure it out. And not only can I figure out what's wrong and I, you know, it's not always, but if I can figure that out and then create a plan to get them moving forward, it doesn't make a huge difference nationally or internationally in sports medicine, but it actually can change a patient's life. And I know that sounds like making more out of nothing, but when we think about physical activity in sports medicine, people being able to be active and healthy, that is their quality of life. And I'm super proud that we get to make a difference with multiple patients every day. And in terms of kind of advice to people that are going to be applying into orthopedic surgery or that are interested in orthopedic surgery, I'm definitely proud of like throughout my entire process through residency, through, um, you know, fellowship and through my current career, I've always tried to stay true to myself and really be myself throughout the situation. Even if it's hard when you're the only female kind of in the room, a lot of the times you can feel pressured to, you know, act differently or act how you think other people want you to. But I would encourage everyone to really just be yourself throughout it, have confidence in your abilities. And that's going to take you further than kind of trying to fit the mold of what the typical orthopedic surgeon is going to look like. Uh, you add value to the team uh, in your own way. And I think that it's made me treat my patients better and kind of had a, had a happier career so far, uh, just feeling confident that I know that I'm going to be adding something to the team by, you know, being myself and yeah. What would be your advice for a potential female medical student who wants to go into orthopedics? What would you say to them? I would tell them to go for it. I mean, it's a great career. It's really rewarding to be able to treat the types of patients that we do and it, it take them from being injured and losing their quality of life to getting back on the field and being able to do the things that they love. So it's an incredibly rewarding career. And, you know, don't be afraid to reach out for help and, you know, ask for people to take that chance to ask for somebody to mentor you or to work with them for research or even that any kind of small or to shadow them in a clinic or any kind of small effort towards that. I, I think that it can go a long way and you'd be surprised how many people are interested in actually helping, even though they're not getting anything out of it besides the fact that they're just helping the younger generation of future orthopedists. Okay. Yeah, and I always say, you know, you got to be a hard worker, but you also have to try to be a good person. So medicine is a small world. And so learning from others and taking, even if it's somebody that you might not think is a great teacher for you, learning from them as much as possible, everybody is an opportunity to learn from. So see what you like about orthopedics, and then you can figure out if you can make that work for you. For me, I actually didn't like the operating room. I liked being outside of the operating room. So I ended up not doing an orthopedic residency. I did a different residency so that I could do orthopedics non-operatively. And that's how it worked for me because that's what I wanted. But if you really love being in the operating room, then you need to be working to get there. So just kind of try to get as many experiences as possible so you know where you want to get so that you can work hard to get there. Okay. So do you have any last words before we kind of end it here? I definitely think both of you, there was a lot of insight and valuable information. So, you know, definitely want to thank you both for joining, but anything else to add? I would add to not underestimate yourself. I think sometimes some people underestimate you because of how you look or how they expect you to act or because of where you come from. And sometimes people underestimate themselves. So if you truly wanted to do orthopedics or sports medicine or musculoskeletal medicine, don't underestimate yourself and don't let others do that too. Those are great parting words. And I think we can apply that to every part of our life to be truthfully honest. So everyone can take that and apply so that. You're wise. You're so wise, Melody. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at myself in my video right now and saying that to me too. That's right. I'm going to take it and apply it to my work every day now. But again, I want to thank you both for joining me. This was awesome. And it doesn't matter, female, male, you guys are just awesome people, great physicians. Every time you hear about it, patients are raving about the two of you. Um, so Rothman, New York is, again, we're, we're lucky to have you. So thanks again for joining. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, Alex. Thanks for having us. So 
Next up, I'd like to introduce Dr. Summer Hamoud. She's a sports medicine surgeon and Dr. Rachel Shikhead, foot and ankle surgeon to the breakdown. So I want to thank you both again for joining me. And let's just kind of start from the beginning. How did you personally get into orthopedics? Who wants to start? So I, I can start. So um, I have a little bit of a cliche story in that I was an athlete growing up. I played soccer um, at UCLA. I ran track as well. Um, I played all other sports kind of growing up, softball, um, really everything you can imagine. Did soccer and track in high school and then focused on soccer in college. I did not have any major injuries, fortunately. However, I was very much shaped by those physicians that I saw on our sidelines and in our training rooms. And even though they were not not specifically focused on myself, I always knew I wanted to be a physician and I always thought to myself, how cool would that be that my job would be taking care of athletes, you know, at a university such as UCLA or, or otherwise. So that was a huge part. You know, the reality is I love sports of all kinds and I love being around athletic people and athletes. And, um, so that desire was definitely there and that was the initial kind of driving force. And then, you know, when you're in medical school and you trial kind of all the different types of things, I already knew I was thinking about orthopedic surgery, but once I did it, I, I mean, it was, you know, you know, closed book. It was sold so quickly, you know, those were my people. I loved the nature of the surgery. We were fixing people, making their quality of life better. And I loved that. And then, you know, at the next stage of training in my residency, same kind of thing, sports medicine surgery, the nature of the surgery, arthroscopic surgery, doing really cool things through very small incisions, working with athletes, uh, working with the other physicians who are sports medicine physicians, it just felt like home for me. And so I think you kind of hone in and develop that specific subspecialty over time, but that was a very natural progression for me. Dr. Shaked? So I came to orthopedics a little bit of a different route. I always knew I was interested in medicine and grew up the daughter of an engineer. So we were always fixing things around the house and I was always the helper. So I always liked the mechanical aspects of that. But more so than that, I was interested in how the human body works. So I, I knew I wanted to go to medical school from a young age. And then in med school, I thought I would do something medically related, like internal medicine. I was really interested in hematology and oncology for a while until I did my clinical rotations as a third year in medical school when I got to work with general surgeons and vascular surgeons and got to see the day-to-day -day aspect of, you know, living life as a surgeon and going in and, you know, seeing a problem and fixing it that very same day. And through that, I was exposed a little bit to orthopedics and I realized that that combined my love for fixing and um, engineering things with um, how the human body works. So then I explored the field that I had never really heard of. I, you know, I, I played a little bit of basketball growing up, but I was never a big time athlete. So I didn't have any experience with injuries or I, I didn't even really know that the field of orthopedic surgery existed until medical school, really. So when I was exposed to it and I saw how cool it was, I decided that that was my career path. <laughs> So what was each of yours experience in medical school? Was there a lot of females there or what, what was kind of like the ratio you would say uh, male to female? For me, it, you know, it always seemed like in medical school, it was a 50-50 split for the most part or very close to it. Um, maybe it skewed in one direction or the other every other year, but, but in general, it was pretty 50-50. But certainly, I was acutely aware of the fact that there were very few women in orthopedics. That is not something that is subtle. It, it hits you, and it's something you're very aware of. It's hard to miss. So what was kind of like, when was your aha moment? You know, this isn't medical school. Here we are. Now I'm in my fellowship. This is different. This isn't what, I, what I'm used to. Well, I would say, um, and Rachel, you know, you can kind of give your thoughts on this, but I would say that as a medical student, I knew what I was getting myself into. I was very much aware. One of my mentors in medical school, she was at Hopkins at the time, she's at Penn now, is Christy Weber. 
who's the first female president of the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgery. So just a really fantastic woman. She's an orthopedic oncologist. And so I did have a very strong role model as a medical student who was doing really big things in the field of orthopedic surgery. And so I had a great example in front of me that even though there are not a lot of women, you can achieve whatever it is you want to achieve based on your desires and your goals. And so even though I saw few women in the field, I knew that by her example, I could work hard and accomplish what I wanted. Our medical school was pretty evenly split as why well. I went to Albert Einstein College of Medicine in the Bronx in New York. But same thing, very few of the women went into orthopedic surgery. There were a few female orthopedic surgery residents that I got to uh, work with as a medical student. And seeing them made me realize that it was doable. But the gender disparity really almost made me want it more just to sort of show that I, I wasn't different than the guys. And would you guys say that the importance of your mentors when you were in medical school and when you went into your fellowship, like how important were, you know, you mentioned your mentor who's the orthopedic oncologist. So I'm just curious to know how much of a role did they play, you know, into helping you kind of guide you along? And, you know, do you feel like you're in that position now where you're kind of guiding those along as well? Fortunately, as a medical student, I actually was able to become involved with the Ruth Jackson Orthopedic Society, um, which is a women's orthopedic society. I, I received a scholarship to attend the annual meeting where, um, you know, the orthopedic surgeons from around the world really get together somewhere in the United States and it's an academic meeting. And so they put on a program for female medical students to show them, you know, what the field of orthopedic surgery, you know, includes. And so I think that that was really pivotal for me because I saw all these women doing it, you know, and despite that there were so few of them. So seeing that made me confident that I should apply and, and go for it. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's interesting because a lot of us have had very similar experiences. I did a very similar thing through the Ruth Jackson Orthopedic Society in, in medical school. And I would say that throughout my career, there have been women who I've seen who've not necessarily played that day-to-day -day role as a mentor for me, but have been examples of achievement and accomplishment at the highest level that have continued to show me that really anything is possible. But I would emphasize that some of my greatest mentors have been men. And I do think that male mentors, particularly white male mentors, is so important not only to increase diversity with women in orthopedics, but also with underrepresented minorities. They do need to be the ones who are promoting us and seeing the talent and pushing us into the next level. Um, I just think that's really important. And I have experienced that myself and it's powerful and they have had some of the biggest impacts on my career. I always say that too, is just because, you know, in the situation where we're talking about, you know, we're speaking women because it's Women's History Month, but I think it's important, like you said, to acknowledge the fact that on the heels of Black History Month, you know, that it's just important and using white allies, specifically white males, and especially in this field, which is predominantly, predominantly. Um, you know, so I think I'm just curious, that was going to actually kind of be my next question is, you know, what are, are the roles? And, you know, um, and I don't want to say it's our responsibility or it's your responsibility because you guys, you know, being underrepresented as women, but Whose responsibility is it? Well, in my opinion, it's a collective effort. It really is the entire body of orthopedic surgeons, you know, through every kind of subgroup of them. So it really is a collective. It is not one person's or one group's responsibility. Women can certainly n not do it alone if there are not those allies. So. It really is a collective effort. It's a it's understanding as a collective group that it's it's important that it's important for appropriate delivery of care to patients for them to see diversity in their orthopedic surgeons that m reflects their community. You know, we can touch on a lot of things, and I was about to go into a kind of another kind of subtopic. But as a general rule, I think that diversity is important because patients need that. They need to see doctors who are like them, and that data is out there that patients do better when they're treated by 
uh, similar kind of physicians from similar cultural um, and ethnic backgrounds. I'm going to definitely want to come back to that, but I want to hear your answer as far as allies, and then I definitely want to kind of hone in on the the diversity overall with patients. So, I mean, I I definitely think it falls on like there's there's responsibility on my shoulders because I, you know people have advocated for me to advance in my career, and so now I feel like it's my job to pay it forward to do the same for underrepresented groups that belong in orthopedic surgery and just may not have gotten there because of history of who goes into this field. So, so yeah, I do think it's our responsibility to pay it forward in a way and help to pull up those women, you know, in the context of this conversation who would excel in orthopedic surgery and improve the field as a whole. So, yeah, I definitely want to circle back to that comment you made. So, why is diversity important in orthopedics? And again, we can speak about women and we could speak about um, people of color as well, because I think it's definitely both are important. But why do you both feel that it is important? Well, I think I, I've kind of touched on on that. You know, I don't know, Rachel, if you have other thoughts. I, I mean, I definitely have had patients come to me and say that they were specifically looking for a female physician and not only female patients, interestingly, some male patients have said to me, like, you know, I, I like seeing female doctors because I feel like they listen to me but more, you know, they hear me out, which yeah, of course is not, is not across the board. I mean, there's certainly um, male physicians who are very good listeners, right? You know, but in general, that seems to be what um, the patient perspective is. So offering that service to patients is our duty, really. (laughs) So I'm just curious. I know, again, you guys kind of highlighted it a little bit in some of your answers, but what specifically do you feel that you've done to kind of push women forward in orthopedics? I really enjoy mentoring the medical students through um, the Jefferson Medical School. So each year I am assigned like one or two mentees and I work with them to help show them what's involved in the field of orthopedic surgery. I think that what the students are seeing, you know, they're in medical school, they're seeing the residents do their orthopedic surgery residency, but they're not really seeing beyond that what life as an orthopedic surgeon can be, what the career is like the day in, day out, seeing patients in the office, operating, you know, one or two days a week. So I don't think that they're exposed to that as much. And so what I've really tried to do is to show the medical students that yes, like the five years of orthopedic surgery residency is very tough and you pour a lot of hours of work into it. But then when you're finished with that and you have your career built in front of you, yes, you're still working hard, but it's, it's manageable. You can balance your life. Um, And so I really tried to show that to my mentees to hopefully encourage more women to consider this field. So, um, I have been involved uh, since uh, my time in residency at the Hospital for Special Surgery with the PERI initiative. At that time, it was uh, mainly targeted at high school girls who were interested in uh, the related fields of orthopedic surgery and biomedical engineering. And um, we held basically full day workshops for them, lectures from orthopedic surgeons at different levels, what it's like to be an orthopedic surgeon, what it's like to be um, a biomechanical engineer, how the fields relate to one another and we take them through hands-on workshops and so that is to try to start early on to introduce young girls to the fields that are both very underrepresented in women it has uh, evolved to also now target as we've kind of continued to do research as a, as a society and try to figure out well where are our efforts best targeted in order to increase the complement of women in orthopedic surgery. We've come to this fact that the reality is there are 50% women in most medical schools these days and a greater percentage of women. And so why are so few women in medical school choosing orthopedic surgery? And so we've targeted medical students in their first and second year of medical school. It's a program called the Medical Student Outreach Program. And we've taken an evening uh, from four to eight and we've introduced them through lectures about orthopedic surgery, what is it like to be a day in the life of, how do you do work-life balance, what is cool about what we do, what do we like about it, 
what are the different subspecialties you can get into and then again taking them into hands-on sawbones types of workshops and some young uh, women have never necessarily handled a, a power tool and so we do that in orthopedics and so we get their hands on it and let them try it in a safe environment and many of them that may have been the thing that was intimidating to them about it maybe they had never seen women and so we put in front of them women you know residents fellows uh, tendings um, who are orthopedic surgeons who look and and uh, are very similar to them and, and have lives, you know, and we show them that it's possible. That program has been extremely impactful. Um, and in studying and looking back over a few thousand of those women who have done the program, we have seen up to 25% matriculate into orthopedic surgery residency. That is a huge number. Um, so that is one of the ways i'm on the peri initiative board of directors it's a program that i just really love and it's something that we continue here at jefferson we're planning one for the spring it's going to be virtual because of covid but we have always received just raving reviews from the medical students that have attended um, it's really well received and it shows them that orthopedic surgery is a great field they get excited about it and if they were even remotely thinking about it it tends to spur them on and so that's great you mentioned just work-life balance and we're sitting here um dr shaked you're what eight days out from just having a newborn baby boy so congrats on that but what is the what is the work-life balance like you know it's the easy thing we always typically ask women because we feel like you know it's it's women, you know, you guys are the ones that have to kind of do that. And we don't necessarily always ask men, what's your work-life balance? Because a lot of times, you know, there's someone in the background that's managing for that. So what's that like for you? So that it's a challenge. I mean, there's no question about it. Um, it takes having a good support system and outsourcing some of the things that need to be done, you know, like laundry and food shopping and things like that um, to get into the specifics of it. But I think that having a career that satisfies you, that gives you, um, you know, makes you want to go to work each day is the most important thing. And then figuring out the rest of your life and how everything falls is doable as long as you like what you're doing, you know? So, and that's very much the case for me. So personally, you know, my husband also is an orthopedic surgeon. So we have, you know, an, a challenge in terms of our scheduling and we each take call at different hospitals and, you know, our surgery days start early and can go late. Um, so, you know, with our two little boys, we, we make it work. You know, we have families that are involved and um, we have a, a wonderful babysitter who works with us. And we each um, try to schedule our weeks strategically so that at least one of us has a little bit more time with our kids and, you know, they're seeing us. But through, you know, there's this social media, like women's orthopedics group that I'm involved in that's been really supportive. And so you hear a lot about how everyone is managing their work-life balance because unfortunately the, the reality is that it does fall on the mom, you know, to, to handle right. those things and organize the schedule and, you know, the activities and school camp and all that stuff. Um, but what I've heard overwhelmingly is that kids who grew up in that kind of situation where the parents are working really hard and making a difference in people's lives you know the kids grow up really respecting what their parents are doing that even if they're not around you know for school pickup every day of the week or they're not the ones dropping the kids off at school in the morning that they know that their parents are out um, you know like my three-year-old son knows that we fix bones you know and <laughs> he asks us in the morning how many bones are you going to fix today <laughs> the time that we spend with our kids is very high quality and um, I'm hoping that it garners respect from my kids when you know as they're growing up so and it, it works for me you know I I, I enjoy what I do and I think that um, if I were at a job that took up less hours of my week and I wasn't happy it would be worse. it wouldn't be as good of a situation so that, that's how I make it work yeah, I, I would echo everything Rachel said. I, I mean, I just agree, you know, with everything. Um, and we also, you know, have a nanny who helps us, uh, who is essentially part of our family, you know, because both mine, my husband's parents are, you know, older and are not 
close by and can't really help support that as much as they would love to. But, you know, you figure out how to make it work. I think that if you you and your partner are on the same page and support one another and each other's goals, then, you know, everything else, you can figure it out. Mm-hmm. And like Rachel said, I, I spend, you, you know, quality time with my kids um, evenings and weekends and very similar sentiments from my older son who asks me, oh, how many patients are you operating on today? What type of surgery did you do? Um, Did you fix any ACLs? Like, right, once he hears something, then it's like, that's the thing he's asking about. Um, It's it's cool. And he, you can tell he thinks it's very cool. Mm -hmm. So it's a great thing. I, it it is, it's right for us. Um, You know, I think that one should do what they want to do and not be worried about what others are thinking about it. Um, if it's right for you and your family, that's what you should do. Um, and like Rachel said, uh, to make things work, outsource as much as possible. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing wrong with a little extra, yeah. extra hands there. So I want to pose to each of you one kind of final question. What would be your advice to our future female orthopedic surgeons? I think that it's really important to go and see what a day in the life is like as a female orthopedic surgeon, Um, you know, having that idea of what you're going through all of the residency and fellowship training for is really important so that you can kind of see the the light at the end of the tunnel. Not that training is not fun. It certainly was some of the best years of my life, you know, and I made wonderful friends, um, had a lot of different experiences and you know but um seeing what the end game is is really important so i think that get it you know reaching out to um attendings like summer and myself is important we're always happy to have people come and shadow us and see see what's involved because that's the best way to know if if the career is going to be for you and then once you're hooked on it then you know it's it's uh easy going from there i would say that to be great at anything is hard work, right? To be a great surgeon, any type of surgeon, to be a great physician, to be a great lawyer, to be a great teacher, it's all hard work. Um, So you're never gonna be great at anything without hard work. So don't shy away from the tough road ahead because it is tough. It It is really hard work and you really devote yourself entirely to it and to the process. And you have to, to be great at it. And as physicians and as surgeons, we really have the honor of kind of people allowing us to operate on them and to take care of them. And it's really a really, really tremendous gift that we're given. And you can't take that lightly, right? You, you have to be the best that you can possibly be. And so I would tell them it's a hard road, but it is so worth it. It's like really the best job. So <laughs> that's what I would say. <laughs> so don't, don't give up. It is, it's awesome. It's amazing. It is definitely for women. There is nothing about it that is somehow just special for men. And the patients, they want to see you. They want to see you on the other side, you know, of the door when they walk in, they want to see you at the OR table. They do seek out women and uh, you are completely capable of of doing it. Just to kind of wrap it up, just thank you both. I know kind of when I approached you both to do this, like I said, we have a small group of female physicians at this practice, but a small but mighty. Um, And the ones that we do have here are fantastic and you guys are two of them and always on the top of everyone's list. So... I just want to thank you guys. Um, great insight. I honestly wish we I, like there's so much more, and I'm and I'm not just saying that, but I'm like, tell me more, tell me more. But thank you both again, seriously, for you know being here and just kind of you know sharing your insight. Um, and yeah, thank you. Thanks for having. Thanks for inviting us. Once again, I'd like to welcome Dr. Alex Vaccaro, president of Rothman Orthopedics, as well as spine surgeon. Um, As I mentioned, I thought it was important to get your take on this topic because you're not only a leader of this organization, but you're absolutely a leader in the field of orthopedics. So I thought people would be curious to hear your take on this topic. Um, And I saw on the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgery, AAOS's website, um, this little stat. So we'd just love to know your thoughts on it before uh, we kind of kick it off. So there are now more women in medical school than men yet there are still orthopedic residency positions that have never been held by a woman. Women represent only about 14% of orthopedic trainees. 
So I guess my question to you is, why do you think there are fewer women in the specialty than others, or why, why is it so male-dominated? Sure, so it's interesting. The numbers are actually this. In academic orthopedics, about 17% of the positions are held by females. In private practice orthopedics, only 7 to 9% are held by orthopedic surgeons. And, and the cause is so heterogeneous. So it starts from the very beginning. We don't have enough role models for women in orthopedics right now because people tend to look to their peers, they look to their mentors, and they say, listen, I want to be like that person or I can take that field further. So number one, instead of people saying we have to get more people to be interested to become residents in orthopedics, I take the opposite position. We need to put more women in positions of leadership in orthopedics to make it more attractive for females to go into orthopedics. And I think that we will all agree that a diverse, inclusive workforce is a more productive, more satisfying, more uh, value-driven workforce. So it's our responsibility as leaders to make sure that we put females in, in board positions, females as chief of orthopedic division leaders, uh, and we have to get rid of all the hidden biases that stop that from happening. Now, let, let me elaborate even further. At the Rothman Institute, uh, we were a male-dominated organization to the point where we said this is not appropriate, and we said there has to be a woman on the board. And the system before that was there were rules. You had to be a partner for a certain amount of years. You had to have a revenue of a certain amount of money. You had to then be voted among your peers to get in. Well, there's many different biases. A woman may decide to have a family. A woman may be the primary care provider. They can't generate the income necessary to get the revenue to qualify for that position. There's no females that were partners for a certain amount of time. So there's like so many different rules. And we've asked the Rothman Institute to look at the rules and remove all, all those hidden biases, all the rules that would prevent a woman to get on the board. And you'd be surprised, some people were against it. They were saying, listen, you know, there's going to be sensitive financial information that's going to be disclosed, and we think that only a partner. And I argue against that. I said, now listen, if there's certain things that certain people, because of their position, do, should not have access to, uh, a non-partner should not have access to partners' financial backgrounds, then, then we'll change that, and we'll, that person can be recused. But you should never hold the fact that any individual wants to be a primary care provider for their children as a reason why they can't advance. And that goes for females and males. And that's one of the things we have to change. Even at the federal level, it's confused. So I say we should jump ahead of, of laws and say, listen, let a woman be the president. Let a woman be the chairman. You know, and, and they're qualified. There's no, I mean, I can't even come up with a reason not to allow a woman to advance to that position. So we're working on that every day. At the Rothman Institute, we developed a diversity inclusion program where they get together and they discuss all the issues pertinent to making sure that this is a diverse and inclusive workforce. And then they submit that to me as the president and to the board. And we take it very seriously. And we do everything we can to develop a system where we invite people of color, people of diverse backgrounds, uh, genders that are not fully represented to have leadership positions at the Rothman Institute. And I, I think that's absolutely important because, you know, we're just on the heels of Black History Month and, you know, we're speaking now because it's March and it's Women's History Month and International Women's Day is, um, you know, March 8th. But I think, like you mentioned, having women and people of color on, you know, the board. And But why is that important? You know, we could sit here and we can say, you know, we need to do this and we should have these people. But what do you think that brings to the table and how so does it be better? Yeah, number one, it's the right thing. Number two, it's the just thing. Number three, it's the fair thing. And the most important thing that it does, it makes us a much more competitive organization. Every single study that have come out have looked at diverse workforces are more productive, they have greater worker satisfaction, they get more stuff done, and they tend to be more creative and more innovative. So there's not an argument against not making it as diverse as possible. I look at some of the women that we have, uh, some of the you know physicians that we have, and you know they're a small group but a mighty group, and you know many of them are they're running marathons or they're doing research and they're having families and doing all the above, and you know I, like you said I think we're lucky just to have these women you know as part of Rothman Orthopedics, but what do we do at the I guess the grassroots level to kind of make sure like where do where does it start kind of like the recruiting process and making sure that these you know, here they are today, but what do we do, you know, from the bottom? Sure. So from the bottom up, as you said, medical students are 
there's more females than males in medical school, so boom, you check that off. That's a great accomplishment because I think society is like 51 or 52% female and, and 48%, I think. Um, don't quote me. I'm not an epidemiologist. No, I think but you're I, pretty I, young. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. So the so medical school is fine. Then you look at orthopedic residency programs. Our leader in terms of our residency director is Dr. James Bertil, and he has done a fantastic job. Even though the applicants, female applicants, are low compared to the male applicants, he's been able to get at least one to three females out of six as residents each year. Some years we've had three, which is fantastic, 50-50. So from an orthopedic residency perspective, we're doing the right thing. Hirees. Now, we're sitting here hiring people, so now we have to make sure we get enough female applicants. And what we should do, and, and we're doing now, is there shouldn't be any application that's filled that doesn't have a diverse application pool. We just recently hired a CEO. So one of the stipulations we said to the search firm was that it had to be a minimum of 50% female applicants or don't come to us. And it had to be a minimum of 30% people of color or don't come to us. And we didn't want to hear an excuse. Oh, well, we didn't get enough applications. And they said, well, then we'll find another search firm because this is what we need to do. So we have to take the woman we have in our group put them in a position of power so they make other females that look to apply to our orthopedic group and say, I like that group. They really put their money where their mouth is. They have a woman on the board. They have a woman who's team leader or team physician for a sports team. I want to be part of that group. So that's the next level that we have to accomplish and that's something that we're in the process of doing at the Rothman Institute. Just speaking a little bit more, like you said, you were talking about we're such a large organization here and we are kind of reflective of society. So I think people would appreciate knowing, you know, our processes and what we do as far as medical students and even our hiring processes. So maybe speak a little bit more about, you know, this diversity um, and inclusion committee. Kind of what are the goals for that? Or, you know, last year was an interesting year and this kind of brought this subject to the forefront. So I'm glad that we're having these conversations. And again, I'm thankful for you sitting down and talking to me and everyone and about it but you know what are our hopes with this committee and what are we thinking we want to do and again how to push things forward so it's interesting when you ask people to say I want you to do a 360 on yourself and find out what your weaknesses are and things you can do better well then you get a certain amount of ideas the board can do an introspective look but it's even better when you set up a separate committee people motivated and dedicated and they do a protected 360 of the organization and say, do we have the right people representing the different divisions? Are are we diverse in the joint division? Are we diverse in the spine division? Are we diverse in the foot and ankle? Uh, And if not, why not? Let's figure out what the problem is. Is this from the top up? We have to look exactly what the problem is. And then they come up with suggestions. Say, we've analyzed this group of positions in this area and we think you would benefit from any application you have or any applicant for a particular position, make sure at least 50% are females and, and so forth. So that's what this group has done. Besides just giving the recommendations, they've, they're also proven through evidence-based literature on how these various divisions do well when you have a diverse workforce. So it's, it's besides making requests, they've also shown why it's important and the bottom line, it's the right thing to do. So for those reasons, this group has been fantastic, and it's it's run by Nicole Coleman, and she has physician representatives that have really done a lot of work on it, and I'm, I couldn't be more proud of that group. And do you think also, I'm just looking from the patient perspective, you know, when you go on the website and you see, you know, who's there, you know, is it, I only think that makes us stronger, and I think sometimes with patients, they want to see someone who they relate to, and maybe that's potentially, oh, I want to see this doctor, or okay, this physician speaks my language. So I just look at it, you know, by being more diverse, whether, again, it's, you know, genders or, you know, people of color, I think, again, that only makes us stronger. I think people will appreciate that and just know that we're not an organization that only has, you know, X person is my physician. So, yeah, anything else you'd like to well, add? I think I think that's a great point. People like to go to people they feel comfortable with. If you're a woman and you feel more comfortable with a woman physician, you love it if you see a woman in that particular field. And we see that all across the board. In fact, I do. Like when I have to go for my dermatology examination, they say, take your clothes off, I get embarrassed. So I look for a male to go to. Right. I use the same logic. A woman doesn't want to undress in front of a male physician. So it's like they feel more comfortable. I totally, I totally get it, and we're, we're looking for that. So people like to identify with those that take care of them. And again, besides saying it's the right thing to do, we just have to do it. There's no excuse now for any organization 
not to be as diverse as what the general population in America is. Well, again, like I mentioned, it was very important just to get your thoughts on that. Um, and they were really great thoughts and just thankful that, you know, we do have a leader like you that believes in that stuff. And I think it's important for the employees to hear it. I think it's important for our patients to hear it. So again, anything you'd like to add to that or anything else? Alex, like usual, you're a tremendous host. I'm always amazed by your leadership ability to sort of bring out the, the topical issues of the day. So I want to thank you for giving me the honor to sit in front of you today to have this conversation. Well, I appreciate you coming back for a second time, kind of like our, our reoccurring guest. So we'll have to make sure whatever our next topic is, it'll have to be just as good. So thank you again. You're welcome, Alex. You have a nice day. We'd like to thank Dr. Bishop, Dr. Hamoud, Dr. Rubish, Dr. Shaked, and Dr. Vaccaro for joining me on this episode. Please visit our landing page, rothenortho.com backslash breakdown for all available episodes. We are on Spotify, Apple, Google, the Rothman Orthopedics YouTube channel, and a few other listening platforms. So whichever platform you prefer, make sure you download and subscribe. Thanks again for listening, and until next time, take care.